Hello again, welcome back to week 44 of year four of the Religious Education Initiative. This is day two. We're continuing through the writings of St. Irenaeus. So last time we read some additional excerpts from book two of five from Against Heresies in which Irenaeus spoke, actually we read about, uh, we, we read some of book three, what am I saying? Uh, but in, in these excerpts, Irenaeus spoke about the incarnation of the Lord and his unity with the Father. So, this time we will see Irenaeus speak about the Lord's incarnation, uh, about his humanity, and about his divinity. So, uh, let, let's see what he says. So, this is from chapter 18 of book 3. Since it has now been clearly demonstrated that the Word who existed in the beginning with God, by whom all things were made, who was also always present with humanity, was in these last days, at the time appointed by the Father, united to his own workmanship, since he became a human being, subject to suffering. It follows that every objection is set aside of those who say, If our Lord was born at that time, then Christ had no previous existence. I have already shown that the Son of God did not then begin to exist, since he was with the Father from the beginning. When he became incarnate and was made human, he began anew the long line of human beings, and, to state it briefly, he furnished us with salvation. Consequently, what we had lost in Adam, namely the image and likeness of God, we recovered in Christ Jesus. The title Christ implies the one who anoints, the one who is anointed, and the anointing itself with which he is anointed. It is the Father who anoints, but the Son is anointed by the Spirit who is the anointing. As the Word declares through Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. This points out that the anointing Father, the anointed, this points out the anointing Father, the anointed Son, and the anointing which is the Spirit. As man contending for humanity, the Lord fought and conquered. Through obedience, he completely did away with disobedience. He bound the strong man. He set the weak free and granted salvation to his own handiwork by destroying sin. He is a most, mer oh, most holy and merciful Lord, and he loves humanity. He caused human nature to cleave to and become one with God. On the one hand, unless a human being had overcome the enemy of humanity, the enemy would not have been justly defeated. On the other hand, unless it had been God who had freely given salvation, we could never have possessed it securely. Unless humanity had been joined to God, humanity could never have become a partaker of incorruptibility. So it was incumbent upon the mediator between God and man, via his relationship to both, to bring them to friendship and peace, and so to present humankind to God while revealing God to humankind. This is also why he passed through every stage of life, restoring all of them to communion with God. It behooved him, who was to destroy sin and redeem humankind under the power of death, to be made human, for humanity had been drawn by sin into bondage and was held by death, so that sin should be destroyed by man and humankind should be delivered from death. For as by the disobedience of the one man who was originally molded from virgin soil, many were made sinners and forfeited life, so it was necessary that by the obedience of one man, who was originally born from a virgin, many should be justified and receive salvation. What he appeared to be, he also was. God recapitulated in himself the ancient formation of man, so that he might kill sin, deprive death of its power, and give life again to humankind. His works are sure. And that was all from chapter 18. So now to chapter 19 of book 3. By no other means could we have attained incorruptibility and immortality unless we had been united to incorruptibility and immortality. How could we be joined to incorruptibility and immortality unless incorruptibility and immortality had first become what we are, so that the corruptible might be swallowed up by incorruptibility? and the mortal by immortality, so that we might receive adoption as children. And then skipping ahead to chapter 24. The preaching of the church is consistent everywhere. It continues on an even course and has its authentication from the prophets, the apostles, and all the disciples. 
It covers the entire history of God's merciful dealing with humanity and presents a sure path to human salvation, namely, our faith. What we have received from the Church we preserve. By the Spirit of God it is always renewing its youth, as if it were some precious deposit in an excellent vessel which renews the vessel containing it as well. This gift of God has been entrusted to the Church, as breath was to the first created man for this purpose, that all members receiving it may be given life. The Church enjoys communion with Christ through the Holy Spirit, the sure pledge of incorruption who confirms our faith. Where the Church is, there is the Spirit of God, and where the Spirit of God is, there is the Church, and every kind of grace, but the Spirit is truth. Okay. So, going back to the beginning here, he's talking about how Christ has become fully human, and uh, you know, he begins you know, saying that you know, he, he effectively he's refuting the accusation, the suggestion that the Son of God came into existence at the point when Christ was born. He says, no, he is pre-existent. He's always existed. And yet he became human at that point in time. And being made human, he began anew the line of human beings. He gave us salvation he renews our nature. This is at least the language that the church comes to use as time goes on. Irenaeus says what we had lost in Adam, the image and likeness of God, we recovered in Jesus Christ. Now this reflection on Christ as the title of anointing is interesting because what Irenaeus is doing here is he is showing the unity of the Holy Trinity, the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit together with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, maintaining the distinction and yet confessing the unity. Uh, so in this way of approaching it, which, again, we see what he's getting at. Uh, he says that the Father is the one who anoints, the Son is the one who is anointed, and the Spirit is himself the anointing. Now, we have to be cautious of this because this kind of line, this, this train of thinking can lead to a... Uh, thinking of the Holy Spirit as just a thing, as less than fully God, as some sort of grace that the Father gives. Um, but that is not the case. That's not even how Irenaeus uses it. Uh, but it certainly is not the case. The Holy Spirit is fully God, and yet he is the anointing with which the Son is anointed. And this is the image that we have presented to us in the Lord's baptism. The voice of the Father bears witness to the Son as the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and rests on his head, this being the sign of the Holy Spirit, being the anointing that rests on the, uh, on the Son of God uh, and, and declares and, and shows him forth to be the, uh, the Son of God and the Son of Man, the true King, of not just of Israel but of all humanity. More things we can say, the, the, the importance he, he, he mentions later in, in chapter 18 here, talking about how uh, the one who saves us has to have been a human, because if, if not a human, then humanity hasn't actually been transformed and delivered from fear of that enemy. Uh, so, so humanity is actually raised up. Uh, but it has to be God himself who does that because no one but God can grant us that salvation. So, and then he goes further and says, uh, we, we could not have become partakers of incorruptibility unless God himself had united himself with us and united us with him because he is the only one who is incorruptible, who is eternal, who is everlasting. So, this image of the communion between God and man that is established in Jesus Christ himself, who is fully God and fully man, who is communion between God and man. This transforms human nature. This transforms human destiny. It opens up to us the door, the way to salvation and purification and immortality. Uh, as, as, as he says in, in chapter 19, quoting St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, incorruptibility is swallowed up, uh, rather, incorruptibility is swallowed up in incorruptibility. Mortality is swallowed up in immortality. So we are adopted as children of God. So 
And then finally, I want to emphasize this beautiful image that the church is like the vessel holding the deposit. The, what, what the church contains is the, the Spirit of God, is the Holy Spirit. But it is the Holy Spirit, what is contained, that constantly renews and makes perfect and makes beautiful the vessel. It's not the vessel that sanctifies what is contained. It is what is contained that sanctifies and renews the vessel. That's actually not how we see anything working in, 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 in daily life. But this is the nature of, of the church. Right? Um, so anyway, uh, I think those are the things to point out. Uh, so God bless you all. We'll see you shortly for uh, day three.